Want a new, awe-inspiring confirmation of Jesus' deity? Well then, get ready to be blown away. Straight after King David killed Goliath, do you know what he did? He took the giant's head that he'd cut off, and he took it straight to Jerusalem and buried it there. This would have been at least 10 or 20 miles distance away. Somehow David knew that this location called Jerusalem was going to be a significant marker in his life sometime later in the future. Therefore, I believe he wanted to declare his mighty victory, the Lord's victory, over the fallen angels, the demons, and all of Satan's realm by burying the head of the giant Philistine there. But here's the problem. At this time, Jerusalem was still under the control of the Jebusites, who occupied the almost impenetrable fortress on top of Mount Zion. Even after 400 years of being in the Promised Land, the Israelites still hadn't been able to dislodge this location from the grasp of the Jebusites. So now let's set the scene. King David is 37 years old, and he's just been crowned king over all of Israel, seven years after being crowned king of Judah upon Saul's death. Then in 2 Samuel chapter 5, with the might of all Israel behind him, King David finally defeated the Jebusites, who occupied that fortress on top of Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, the very city he was destined to live in, and he knew was a prophetic destination in his life. This was actually the first time in history that God's desired capital city on earth had come into the possession of his chosen people. So David then made the fortress on Zion his home base, and he called it the City of David. That's very important to remember for later. He extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces, and worked inward, making it even more secure than it had ever been, even before his invasion. As he made plans to build his big cedar palace, he also pitched a simple tent, which would soon house the Ark of the Covenant. Once the Ark was brought into Jerusalem and successfully put in place, people from all nations of the world were permitted to come inside and enter that worship tent, to bask in the radiance and excellency of the Lord, in all his glory and wonder. In the same way these multitudes, in the time of the reign of King David, ascended up Mount Zion in natural Jerusalem, we can now ascend in the realm of the Spirit to the lofty peak of the true Mount Zion in heavenly Jerusalem. Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Now, every time we enter into praise, worship, thanksgiving, prayer and devotions in his word, we obtain confident access into the same majestic glory emanating now out of the true tabernacle, not pitched by human hands, but pitched by the Lord. It is the heavenly destination through the veil reserved for those who abide in the Spirit. Jesus dwells there constantly, bidding us to come and join him in his presence. Now we know from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 9 that David called the fortress of Zion the city of David. But what we find in Hebrews 12, verse 22 is truly astonishing. It says, You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Here we see that Mount Zion is now located in the heavenly Jerusalem, not the natural one. God has shifted Mount Zion up into the third heaven. And that's where God's true tent is pitched, the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus discharges the entirety of his post-resurrection ministry. As new covenant believers covered in his blood, we are permitted to go inside this tent anytime we please and sit with our royal high priest. But if you were paying close attention, you may have noticed while reading that scripture that another transformation occurred as Jesus ascended into heaven. When Zion moved from the natural Jerusalem up to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city also had a name change. It is no longer called the city of David. It is now called the city of the living God. Now listen carefully. When David established Mount Zion as the capital city of Israel, he was the central figure in natural Jerusalem. He operated as king from his throne situated in his palace on Zion and was also the officiating priest from his tent on Zion. He was a foreshadowing of the great high priest coming later after the order of Melchizedek. 
Jesus is the antitype of the good things that are already here. David was the type and shadow. Jesus is the true heavenly reality. He is the king priest operating on Mount Zion this very minute. When David was operating as king priest, the city on Mount Zion was rightly called the city of David. But now that Jesus is the officiating king priest, the city on Mount Zion above is rightly labelled the city of the living God. Yes, folks, you heard it right. Jesus is the living God. This scripture in Hebrews 12 verse 22 is one of the greatest proofs showing us that Jesus is divine. He always has been and always will be God the Son, the second member of the Trinity. This not only implies that Jesus is God, it also means he is living. Jesus is alive. And what comfort this should bring, that our high priest won't suddenly die on us like the high priests of old. His chain of heavenly intercession will never be broken. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore he is able to completely save those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Hebrews 7, verse 23 to 25.